Senate Bill 213 is an attempt to rewrite or update something called the Flint River Drought Protection Act. That law was passed in the early 2000s, back when uh, Georgia had finally managed to drag its sorry ass into the tobacco settlement so we could get the money. And uh, we got the tobacco money, and there was a great rush to spend it as quickly as they could. <coughs> there was a lot of noise about, well, we're going to take care of the tobacco farm, and da 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 But it turns out the biggest water of that money went to the Flint River Drought Protection Act, and nobody ever put tobacco in the Flint River and water the money. There's cigar tobacco down in the block. Tobacco is all to the east of there. They, they, they had a need, and they spent the money. What they tried to do was to, they had an auction where you could uh, bid to not run your irrigation. Use your <coughs> irrigate in the Darty Plain during a period of drought. They would have this auction and they would pay people to not irrigate. And the theory was that by doing that, the amount of water in the river would increase. And uh, the reason for that is tied up with the amount of water Atlanta wants to use to grow, and the amount of water <coughs> that is state's pretty much obligated to send downstream to Florida. And the idea was that they would take the tobacco settlement money and pay farmers in the Darty Plain to not use enough water so that Atlanta could use that same volume of water and what wasn't used in the Darty Plain would go to Florida and not have to come from Atlanta to go to Florida, but come from the Darty Plain to go to Florida. And so they did that for two years. It didn't affect water flow at all. It cost a lot of money, though. They paid all these farmers. It didn't change the flow in any measurable way. So they ran out of money at the same time that they determined it didn't work anyway. So that was kind of convenient. And so the law just sat there more by a decade. And there's a requirement that the EPD director had to declare a drought by March 1st of every year to trigger the money. Coming. Well, there wasn't any money, so they wouldn't declare a drought even when it was falling dry. It was obviously a drought. But they wouldn't declare the drought because then that would have required to spend the money that they didn't have. So they wouldn't change that law and take out that March 1st requirement. Well, I don't think anybody objects to that language coming out of the bill. But when they came forward with their bill, they had a, a, another whole section in there where they were talking about stream flow augmentation, which is a new subject. And in the stream flow of augmentation, which was never defined in the bill or anywhere else, it was just named and talked about, it was said that if there was a stream flow of augmentation project, then any water that got put into the stream as an augmentation would not be available for use by anyone downstream from that point of discharge. Now, as a landowner on that stream, you have the right to withdraw water from that stream for a reasonable use as long as there's water in there and as long as you're not drying out from your neighbors down the street. And this says, no, that water belongs to the augmentation project and it can't be used by you. It can't be used by anybody. It's going to Florida. So we're back to where we were on the first why we started this crap in the first place. First, we were going to pay farmers to not irrigate so that people in Atlanta could withdraw more water. Now we're going to put water in the stream so people in Atlanta can withdraw more water. But the purpose of the law continues to be make sure Atlanta's happy and to help with the rest of them. And uh, this time it was a direct assault on property rights because they were taking the right of those downstream right near in landowners to withdraw that water. We're just taking it away. And the way property law works, property law is very interesting. I spent a lot of time reading up and studying on property law. And it's a fascinating subject. But the thing that's most interesting about it is actually there's two real interesting things about property law. One is the rights that you get, they call the law professors say the bundle of rights that you get when you have real property. The property rights are a bundle of rights. It's more than one. And it's varied. It depends on the piece of property you've got. But the most important thing is that property rights govern relationships between people. That's what they're for. It's not relationships. It's not, you know, the land doesn't have a right. People have a right. But the right runs with the land. 
It doesn't go with the, with the person. It goes with the land. And so the first and foremost property right is called the right of exclusion. You have the right as the property owner to tell someone else they can't use your property, they can't occupy it, they can't rent it, they can't do anything on it unless you agree to it. They get the right to exclude you. The right to exclude anyone. That's the, the, the key property right, the right to exclude. Water in Georgia is a public resource. It's in a natural cycle. It comes back, it goes away, it moves from one piece of property to another. It's a part of the natural system. And one of part of your bundle of rights is you have a right to the exclusive use of the water owner under your land. All of a sudden, the state is wandering in with a law that says, no, you don't. We have the exclusive use of that water. That's an assertion of a fundamental property right and a resource that right now is a public resource that any landowner has a right to. All of a sudden, any landowner no longer has that right. Only the new claimant, the state or its licensee or contractor, has that right. And so the bill basically says anywhere we put one of these pumps and start discharging into a stream, downstream from there, any water that we put in there belongs to us and it's available only for us and our use and our designated purpose and not to the riparian landowner. So we're taking a fundamental, this is an ancient right, this riparian right goes back for centuries. They say, nope, no more. Why are we doing that? So that Atlanta can withdraw more water from this system way up at the top of the system. We're gonna take it out down here and let them have more to take its place. And it means that to meet their ambitions, whatever they are in Atlanta, we're willing to undo centuries of rights that ran with land. And that's what I was talking about earlier. People that want to make money, these property rights are really interfering with their plans and their ability to do what they want to do. And rather than try to figure out a way to work around it, which has been the pattern in the past, you know, we'll adjust it. They're just going to change it. They're just going to take those rights away. And once they're gone, it's not going to be they're not going to be retrievable. We don't have property rights in water in the western states of the United States. The Colorado River doesn't even make it to the ocean anymore. It's all gone because the property rights don't exist on that river. And that's true of every, all the western waters. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's unbelievable that, and fortunately, the legislature, there's a lot of legislators who realize, wait a minute, this is not right. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of legislators who will go along with any crap anybody thinks up if they hear from the right person that they need to do that. And that right person is usually the governor. If the governor says it's a good idea, well, my God, it's a good idea. I just had to have it explained to you. And so it's been explained that it's a good idea. And some of your legislators, I don't want your particular legislators, but some legislators in this area, some of them don't understand that we're throwing away for nothing property rights that have been passed down to us for generations just so Atlanta can have access to water that it probably doesn't even need, but they want to be able to say that they've got it. And that's what this is about. That's what that bill is about. This is about further empowering Atlanta at the expense of everybody downstream. I, I feel better because I could I can't explain it any less than that. That's a it's a complicated bill and it says Flint River Drought Protection Act, but it's about the whole state. Y'all y'all need to understand that. And we were able to beat this thing back in the Georgia House. You need 91 votes to pass the bill. And they say they had 60. We don't think they ever had more than 35 or 40 votes. And the reason we were able to beat it back is because people in groups all over the state, including WWALS, were talking to their legislators from back home and making that happen. We can't, eight or 10 people at the Capitol can't stop something. We work real hard up there, but we can't stop it. It takes everybody working on it, picking up the phone or sending an email or scribbling a little note and faxing it. That, that's how it works, and you may think 16, 18 people in a room on Saturday morning don't matter. I promise you, it matters. If a 
legislator gets a phone call from one person, they notice. All of you have got two legislators, one in the House and one in the Senate. You make two phone calls, you get 36 calls. That's a lot. If I get five calls, it's a raging brush fire for those people. Tiff County 